welcome to the latest episode of the Catalyst Health and Wellness Coaching Podcast. My name is Brad Cooper, and I'll be your host. And you know that famous quote, Jack of all trades and master of none? Did you know that's not actually how the quote reads? The full quote is, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. You'll see why that clarification came to the forefront and what it means for your life, your coaching, if you're a parent, your parenting, in today's interview. Our guest is David Epstein. He's the author of a pair of best-selling books, The Sports Gene, and his recent hit, which, if you haven't read it yet, you've got to put it at the top of your reading list. It's titled Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Speaking of range, David has master's degrees in environmental science and journalism and has worked as an investigative reporter for ProPublica and was a senior writer for Sports Illustrated. I'll just tell you, I've been looking forward to this interview since the day we set it up a couple months ago, and he certainly did not disappoint. So many insights, and and frankly, shared in such an authentic, transparent manner that you just don't see much these days. I think you're going to love this one. If you're listening to this episode the week of its release, there are three key dates to keep in mind. Our next Wellness Coach Certification Fast Track in Colorado is August 10th and 11th, that's a Saturday, Sunday, and then the following week, on a Friday, Saturday, we're in New Jersey, August 16th, 17th, for an East Coast program. As of this recording, there are a few spots left in each one, but check the website, catalystcoachinginstitute.com, for details, or, or reach out to us if you have any questions, results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. And then the first ever Rocky Mountain Coaching Retreat and Symposium in Estes Park, Colorado, September 6th to the 8th, folks, it's less than six weeks away. If you're a coach, you do not want to miss this event. It's going to be fantastic. And you'll be able to say, I was there the first year they ever did that thing. You can find details for it under the retreat tab at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. Or again, reach out to us, results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. Now, let's jump into this interview with David Epstein. Well, David, it is definitely a pleasure to have you join us. I loved your book. Fantastic job, my friend. Thanks very much, and, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the audience knows your background from the, the little intro I did prior to this, but it's really fascinating. Can you give us the short version of how you got where you are today? And I think it gives us a, a pretty good indication of this whole concept of range, by the way. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the quick version and just a little disclaimer. There's, there's a sad tinge to it. So I was a, a competitive runner at one point and I, I was when I was in college and you know on, on the path to becoming a scientist. And one of my friends and training partners uh, dropped dead at the end of a race. And I got really curious how that could happen to a young person who was one of the top ranked people in the country uh, in his event. And long story short, I ended up having his family sign a waiver allowing me to gather his medical records. And it turned out, you know, and sort of investigated and it turned out he'd been misdiagnosed and had a certain disease that's caused by a single gene mutation that's the most common cause of, of athletes dropping dead. And I decided I, I was, I went to science grad school. I was living in a tent in the Arctic when I decided <laughs> um, I want to merge my interest in sports and science and write about sudden cardiac death in athletes for a popular audience. And through a series of kind of odd jobs, I, I made my way to Sports Illustrated as a temp fact checker. And, and thanks to my, you know, my, my sort of ordinary science skills suddenly became extraordinary in the context of a sports magazine. And I did, in fact, write about uh, sudden cardiac death and athletes became the Sports Illustrated science writer, um, and, and that whole you know tragic event led to my interest in genetics, which which that interest just grew and led to my first book, The Sports Gene. Um, and after that, because I like changing things up to to sharpen my skills, I people don't really know this, but right after The Sports Gene came out, I left Sports Illustrated and went to a place called ProPublica and started doing reporting on bad science and uh, drug cartels and things like that, but also ended up in some public debates with Malcolm Gladwell. And that and a few other things led me, led me to pursue, pursue range. And I, I can flesh those out, but I feel like you asked for the short version. I just gave like the <laughs> medium version. No, that's pretty good. I, and I, I actually laughed. Three of my favorite authors, you, Malcolm, and, and Alex Hutchinson are all 800 meter, 1500 meter and miler. <laughs> so there, there must be something in there that uh, you guys draw me. <laughs> you're not even writing about running in most cases. 
back to your book. I, I loved it. it. Fantastic job. Just covers the, the full gamut, really gets you thinking. It's, it's almost the opposite of what we've been hearing the last decade. One of the key aspects was the difference between a kind and a wicked learning environment. Can mm -hmm. you take us through that in, in terms of the differentiation between the two and, and what it means to our pursuits? Yeah, so those are terms coined by the psychologist Robin Hogarth. And a kind learning environment is you know, a domain or endeavor where, uh, with certain characteristics, like the information is freely available, things aren't hidden. Um, there are clear rules. Some, often people even wait for each other to take turns. Uh, patterns repeat, so expertise is based on repetitive patterns, so you're not in sort of a changing work environment. Um, feedback is typically automatic when you do something very quick. Uh, possibly immediate and very accurate. And in, in domains like that, so golf is one of the examples I mm -hmm. use and, and chess is one of the examples I use, um, where the expert's advantage is based on repetition with, with deliberate practice, with focused practice, you get better just by doing it a lot. So in chess, you know, the, the basis of mastery is learning these repetitive patterns. And you, you have to specialize early. If you haven't started studying those patterns by age 12, your chance of reaching international master status drops from one in four to one in 55. Right? Wow. That's, that's also why chess is, uh, you know, relatively easy to automate because the rules don't change, the environment doesn't change, and it's easy to get feedback so you can analyze the games and it's based on repetitive patterns. A wicked learning environment, uh, it, and this is a spectrum, of course, not, sure. not too discreet poles. Sure, sure. Um, you know, information may, some information may be hidden, uh, people aren't waiting for each other to take turns. Human behavior is involved. Um, next steps may not be clear. There may or may not be rules, and they could change at any time without notice. And you can't count on repetitive patterns. And feedback, you, you may get feedback, but it may be inaccurate. It may be delayed. So Hogarth liked the point for as a really wicked learning environment. He highlighted this example of a New York City physician who became famous because he would palpate patients' tongues, so feel mm -hmm. around their tongues. Um, and weeks before they showed a single symptom, he repeatedly could correctly predict that they would develop typhoid. So it's amazing. So he becomes, you know, wealthy and prominent. And as one of his colleagues later observed, using only his hands, he was a more productive carrier of typhoid than even typhoid Mary. Um, so it turned out he was the one spreading the typhoid right. with his hands, touching patients' tongues. But the feedback was giving him the message that he was doing really well. So he kept doing more of it. And now most of us don't quite uh, exist in an environment quite that wicked, but most of us can't count on our work, you know, next year looking like it did last year on being able to, to just um, count on repetitive patterns. And what a lot of the psychological research shows is that in these more wicked domains, people tend to get, if they have narrow repetitive experience, they tend to get more confident, but often not better. And that can be kind of a dangerous combination. Hmm. So interesting. Uh, so related a little bit to that is the concept of match quality or the degree of fit between what you do and who you are. That, that's one of the things yeah. we talk a lot about with health and wellness is when you cross over from an activity being exercise or nutrition or, or whatever, being what you do to simply who you are, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a big barrier that you cross in terms of health and wellness. Can you expand on that concept a little bit more so folks can get their arms around it? Yeah, I mean, you, you put that match quality well. So it's a term that economists use to describe the degree of fit between someone's interests and their abilities and the work that they do. And economists study it because it turns out to be um, you know, quite important for someone's performance and also really interestingly for, and maybe not surprisingly, um, for their motivation and persistence. So as one of the researchers, I talked to for range likes to put it when you get fit, it'll look like grit. And what he means is that when people get in a context where they have high match quality, where the work fits them, they will display the characteristics we associate with grit, like resilience and persistence, even if they didn't before, which is, which is interesting. And, and, and once he said that it was kind of intuitive to me, right? Like as a college athlete, I remember some of the grittiest people, uh, I've ever seen on the track were like the biggest chickens I've ever seen in the classroom and vice versa. <laughs> so, so, so grit, I think we should think of grit as what psychologists call a state instead of a trait, mm -hmm. not something that's just inherent to a person across everything they do, because I think we could all be put in situations where we're not competent and we suddenly don't feel so gritty. And you try to find that context um, that has good match quality for you because it's so important for, for performance. And, and one of the reasons I picked up this issue is because 
because there's a lot of evidence that suggests the earlier we are forced to choose um, what we're doing, the less we could get lucky, but the less sure. likely we are to um, optimize our match quality. Interesting. Yeah, my PhD research is actually in mental toughness, and so there's a lot of overlap with grit. It's really interesting what you're saying about when you get fit, it'll look like grit. It's, a, it's an easy way to remember it. What are some of the things that surprised you most as you were doing your research? Did, were there things that jumped out where you thought, really? Yeah, that's a, you know, actually, that's a great question because my book proposal, and this is a little bit of a, a tangent, but you just sparked this in my head. <laughs> totally um, my book proposal, both of my book proposals have borne little resemblance to my finished book. The arrangement <laughs> bore more resemblance to the finished book than the sports scene, which was totally different. But in the range, the, the title of the proposal was Roger versus Tiger. So mm -hmm. the, the intro of the book ended as he called Roger versus Tiger, using these two stories to contrast two different developmental paths that, that both led to the top. And my idea was to go through these different domains, sort of like almost alternating, saying like here in these domains, it's better to develop like a Roger where you're sort of broad early before you specialize. And when you arrive at specialization, you have this sort of broad toolbox. And here are these domains where it's sort of better to be a tiger. And as I went through this, so many of the domains that seemed more relevant to modern work to me were showing that Roger pattern. So I ended up leaning completely in that direction where trying to like repeatedly, you know, sort of stop and add caveats through the book saying like, by the way, you know, here are areas where specialists are really useful and we also need them too. So, so that was a surprise that I ended up going so far in that one, one direction. Yeah, I didn't yeah. intend that on a more micro level. The, the one that surprised me the most was this one done in the, in the chapter called learning fast and slow. But for, first of all, that whole chapter surprised me because I hadn't, this is about learning techniques. And one of the surprises for me was there's some really well-known, really well-supported learning techniques in cognitive psychology. And I, I didn't know most of them. And um, when I would go to a university and ask the people who studied this, like what the teachers, you know, what the teacher's college down a couple blocks away, think about it. It was, became clear to me that there's like no communication between the two. Mm -hmm. So the, the people studying the best learning techniques and the people training teaching have like no interaction, which is was surprising and troubling. But, but anyway, so the study that kind of took me back the most was this one done at the U.S. Air Force Academy. And partly because the Air Force Academy just has this incredible setup for a study of the impact of teaching quality that you, you basically couldn't replicate in, well, you could in very few other places. Because the Air Force Academy every year gets in, you know, about a thousand students in the entering class. And those students have to take a sequence of three math courses, calculus one, calculus two, and then you know, follow up to third course, and they are randomized to calculus one professors, then they are re-randomized to calculus two professors, and then re-randomized again, and they all take the exact same test, and the student characteristics are, um, you know, the researchers studying this saw that they were spread out evenly across classes, and so this gives you this incredible setup to study thousands of students over a decade um, and a hundred different professors and see what really is the impact of teaching. And, and by the way, the tests are graded by committee, so no one can like boost their own hmm. student scores. Um, and what they found was that there was an inverse relationship between how, how much calculus one students overachieved. So this would be how well they did compared to, compared to how well they were predicted to have done based on the characteristics they, they brought in. So the more they overachieved in calculus one, the more they then underachieved in the next two follow-on courses which is really counterintuitive. Not only that, so, so for example, the professor whose students did the sixth best in terms of overachieving on the calculus one test, and they rated him the seventh best out of 100 professors, they then performed dead last in the next two follow-on courses. Mm. And what the researchers concluded was that the, the way to get the best performance in calculus one, on the calculus one test, was to teach a very narrow curriculum that imparted lots of what's called using procedures knowledge, where you basically teach people how to execute algorithms, more or less. And when they come to the test, they do that. And because they do well on the test and because they are learning very quickly, they rate the teachers really well. The teachers who taught a much broader curriculum imparted what's called making connections knowledge, where you connect all these different concepts, you broaden the curriculum, you, instead of teaching procedures, you, you are teaching uh, students to create these more abstract conceptual models where they try to match a strategy to a type of problem. 
And that's a slower type of learning and it's more frustrating. So the students rate their learning lower, they rate their professors worse, Mm -hmm. and then they go on to overachieve in the subsequent courses. And that, when I read that, it sort of hit me that, well, that one, we're not set up to evaluate our our own (laughs) learning necessarily in the best way in, in the short term. Right. And it hit me that like one of the themes of the book, you know, cause I came across this maybe like a quarter of the way through the report, um, that one of the themes of the book would be this idea that things you can do to cause the most rapid short-term improvement can sometimes undermine long-term development. So mm-hmm. that, that sort of became this, this sort of analogy in my head for a lot of the other things I was writing about. Right, right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So the phrase jack of all trades and master of none is is one that you hear all the time. People usually use yeah. it in a negative way. You know, they're kind of feeling like they're not enough or somebody else isn't enough in comparison to other people that are really good at a thing. What would you say in reference to that perspective based on everything that you've, you've read, you've written about, you've talked about, et cetera? Well, one sort of interesting point on that is I, I think it's, it's culturally telling that we leave off the end of that adage, which is, so the full adage is jack of all trades, master of none, oftentimes better than master of one. Um, but we, we, we seem to have just dropped that part. Yes. Um, yeah. How that didn't end up as like the epigram in my book is just stupid. <laughs> me, but um, maybe, maybe for the afterward or something. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to denigrate specialists at all. We, we totally need them. The, the way I view this sort of conceptually, and this is why I quoted Freeman Dyson, the, the eminent physicist and mathematician in the book, where he gave this famous speech where he says, we need both birds and frogs. The frogs are down in the mud looking at the, the fine details. The birds are up above. They can't see those fine details, but they integrate the knowledge of the frogs. And he said, for a healthy ecosystem, we need both birds and frogs. Mm. The problem is we're telling everyone to be frogs. Right. And, and there we become not agile and we become siloed from one another. And that's, that's how I feel about it. And I actually think that some of the work shows that as that frogness has proliferated, it's created more opportunities for these people who are integrators. That and the combination of communication technology that allows information to be disseminated so quickly. Mm -hmm. So then you see these patterns, like when I looked at patent research, where for much of the 20th century, it was indeed specialists who were creating the most impactful patents. And and specialists were defined as uh, the U.S. Patent Office has 450 classes of technology and then a bunch of tons of subclasses and specialists were people who had worked in a very small number of classes over their career or or maybe just one generalists were people who had worked in a large number across a large number of classes and for most of the 20th century the specialists were the ones who made more impact but with the dawn of the knowledge economy where suddenly specialist knowledge is disseminated incredibly quickly and there's a huge amount of information available to anyone suddenly it's easier to be broader than a specialist. Mm-hmm. And starting about late, late 1980s, the biggest, the most impactful patents start to come instead from these people who um, have worked across a really large number of technology classes. And what they're often doing is kind of akin to, to what I alluded to, where I took like my ordinary science skills were suddenly extraordinary when they were placed in the context of Sports right. Illustrated. Right. They're, they're often taking something from one area that, that is well known in that area and bringing it to another place where it's not so well known but it has a big impact. So it's like these, almost like these sort of intellectual arbitrage opportunities, you know, and, and that is, that trend is, is still continuing to accelerate in the, in the, those generalists favor. Um, so, so while I think we need both, I think the drive to specialization has, you know, you, you might think that means we shouldn't have any generalists, but I think in fact, a lot of the data suggests it means there are more opportunities for generalists than there were before. Hmm. Interesting. It, it, it kind of reminds me of in triathlon, the average runner fi- suddenly finds themselves being the best out there on the course because the best runners aren't willing to get in the pool. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I mean, right. That reminds me of this concept um, called skill stacking sort of where, you know, you don't, this idea that you don't have to be like number one at any particular thing, but if you can sort of layer different skills in a way mm-hmm. where you're, you're pretty good at a bunch of different things. You kind of end up creating your own, you know, your, your own unique integration of different skills that it in fact makes you unique, even though you may not be the absolute best person at any single one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very good. 
All right. So the, the in quotes, range of, of all the people you quote in your book, I was fascinated. You had Van Gogh, you had Van, Dan Gilbert. You talk about Tiger Woods at length, obviously, in that first chapter. Obviously, you apply the concepts that you discuss in your book in terms of your own research, your own reading. How, where did that come from? How did you develop that pattern or that, uh, that habit in your own life? That, that's, a, that's a great question because I have not always been a big reader by any stretch of the imagination. It's sort of developed later, and which is funny because one of my, probably my favorite novel, sorry, I have a digressive brain that I have to organize. <laughs> that's all right. That's why so when, I like so when you get to, We can go all when in. You get to see this brain in, in real time, it's uh, <laughs> less organized than a book. So, so my favorite novel that I read in the last year was this one called There There by a guy named Tommy Orange. And I subscribe to this like monthly independent book where Powell's, the great independent bookstore, sends you like a book of their choice with this exclusive Q&A and everything. And I was interested to see, because so since I liked the book so much, I, I went to back to read his Q&A and they asked like writers, what's the, you know, what's the secret of your success or whatever? And, and he said it was a late start because he, he basically got a job in a bookstore and books were so novel to him that he sort of wasn't over it and just started devouring them. And then was like, I want to do this. And, and my reading life has sort of been like that too. I sort of came to it late and became, became voracious. For me, one of the treats of range, I mean, both, both my books, you know, behind them are my own curiosities. The sports sure. scene in many ways, my first book was, you know, my own list of questions about the balance of nature and nurture in different aspects of the sports world that had accumulated from my own experience as an athlete or as a spectator, right? Like chapter one was about why major league baseball hitters can't hit softball pitchers. And that was just because I had seen this happen once and just start thinking to myself like, wait, these guys can hit hundred mile per hour fastballs. This woman's throwing 60 from a 43 foot mound, but that means the ball actually takes slightly longer to get there and it's bigger. So what's going on here, right? And that, that becomes the question <laughs> that goes into, into chapter one. And range was sort of the same way where I, I wanted to take on a project that stretched me broadly. I wanted to think about my own um, career progression. And that, that's, you know, when I was getting out of science grad school, again, when I was living in a tent in the Arctic, and living in a tent in the Arctic gives you some time to start asking yourself, doing very, very <laughs> specialized work, gives you some time to ask yourself, am I the type of person who wants to spend my whole life learning one pretty abstruse thing that's new to the world? or much shorter spans of time learning things new to me and, and sharing them. And I, I didn't even recognize, you know, the, the, the importance of maybe integrating for other people at that time. Um, but I was definitely the latter. So I specifically want to take on these projects that, that bring me into new areas. And the biggest gifts for me of range, honestly, were having to report the chapters about art and music gave me the, I had been interested in art already, but they, when you, when you read with an eye toward the fact that you're going to have to write about something, I process it in like a much deeper way. Oh, sure. Um, and that's why like when I talk to people about their jobs, I like always pretend like I'm gonna have to write a report about it next day because I'm interested in people's work. And if you, if you go into it like that, I think you ask like much deeper questions. So this reporting about art and music, most of which doesn't end up in the book, gave me these like framework, this like grounding to start becoming, um, you know, a self learner in these areas. And so now my experience of going to a museum or listening to a concert has totally changed. And that's something I was hoping for. I wanted to learn more about art and music. Um, I spend the first year of both my books not even writing. I just, I try to read 10 journal articles a day, every day for the first year. Mm. That's my goal. I don't get it every day, but, but some days I get much more than 10 because when I was living in New York, I have an alumni reading card for Columbia and there's four computers that are simultaneously logged into every single journal the university has access to. And so all the citations are hyperlinked. And so you can just, I mean, you can get through like 50 <laughs> pages in a day. Rabbit trail. Feels, like, yeah. And, you know, most of that ends up, I surface and I'm like, how did I ever think that was you know, going to be useful? But that sort of expansive, expansive search function, I think having the willingness, the temperament, and also the time and freedom, for which I'm very lucky, um, to do that expansive search is basically my competitive advantage, you know? So I, I'm a very curious person and I'm, you know, very much with a lot of good luck, um, have gotten to a place where I can spend a lot of time just humoring my own sort of meandering expansive curiosity. And so, so I think you see that in my, in, in my projects. Yeah. And definitely a big payoff for the readers. All right. I was having breakfast with a friend of mine. Uh, he's a, Big time exec, and he had some questions organizationally. So let me throw this one out to you. He said he, he wanted to know how does how does a, he's read your book. He said how does leadership facilitate 
getting people those various experiences that you talk about within the same company, or is that not possible? Organizations, they, they, they want that broad experience, but they don't want to lose people in the process. Any suggestions exactly. along those lines? Yeah, that's a great question. That gets to, to a number of different things. I, I was looking at some LinkedIn research recently that found that one of the best predictors of who would become an executive was the number of different job functions. I saw that. Across. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I sort of wonder if maybe it's sort of like Adam Grant's like givers and takers of people familiar with that, where he found that the givers occupy both tails of their um, workplace, where the, some of them are the least productive and some of them are the most productive, because some of them they're giving ends up being really productive and people help them too, and others end up just only giving and people just start taking from them and they become really non-productive. And I sort of wonder if these people who have these incredibly broad experiences sometimes have a hard time like justifying what they've been doing and other times they become the executives. Hmm. And so, you know, how do you give, how do you give people a chance to do that? Because those people on LinkedIn were generally leaving and would have to leave to do that. Right. They weren't doing it inside the same place. And so it's a great question because this, this again gets to this issue of, doing something that might be the best in the short term might undermine long-term performance. So let me, let me think about the, the comic book study that I really liked um, in, in range where a group of researchers who had, were used to sort of studying industrial processes made all these hypotheses about what would cause a comic book creator, whether mm -hmm. a team or an individual, to be most likely to make a breakthrough, um, like a, a huge hit. And they hypothesized it would be experience, years of experience, or resources of the publisher, or a number of different, you know, previous number of comics. And it turned out none of those, because it's not an industrial process. It's more of a wicked environment. We have to create something totally new. And it turned out to be the number of different genres that an individual had worked across hmm. within the comic industry. But the really most interesting thing to me was the fact that at a small number of genres, you were better off with a team of specialists. So you were better off with three single genre specialists as a creative team than with an individual who had worked in three different genres. Hmm. But after five genres, that changed. So something about the individual after five genres became this inimitable unit of knowledge integration. But the problem there is unless you allow them to have more than five genre experience, then they then you'd be better off just with a team of specialists. So how do you incentivize someone to say like, yeah, we know they're going to, you could replace them with a the team early on that would do better. But if you allow them to do this exploration first, they will surpass later on. Right. And how do you, how do you do that within, um, you know, within an individual company? And I think a good model to think about for that is one that I only mentioned very briefly in range, which is the army's talent based branching program where, you know, they started having this problem where they were, they were like hemorrhaging their highest potential right. future officers. So that it, in fact, the more likely they were to give someone a scholarship and the bigger the scholarship, uh, the more likely that person was to quit as soon as they could. So that's obviously not good. Um, and they realized they, at first they thought they like developed a grit problem overnight. And then they realized they had developed a match quality problem overnight. So with the explosion of the knowledge economy, which allows all this lateral mobility for people who can engage in knowledge creation and problem solving, the highest potential candidates were were just leaving because they were seeing better opportunities outside. So first they throw money at them, right? And the people who are going to stay, stay and take it. And the people who are going to leave, leave anyway. That's a half billion dollars of taxpayer money down the drain. Um, and then they start these programs like talent-based branching, where instead of saying, here's your career path, go up or out, they say, we're going to pair you with a coach. Try this career path first, reflect on how it fits you with the coach, then this other one, this other one, and then these two other ones, and keep reflecting on each one you try with your coach, and we'll triangulate a good fit for you. And that's turned out to be worth much better for retention than, than money did. And I think that one helps people find match quality, and it gives them this broad exposure to what's available and a little bit of depth, understanding what their colleagues do and dabbling in these different genres of work. And, you know, you might look at that and if you use different terminology, you'd say, oh, basically, they're like teaching people to quit the things that, that don't really work for them well. But I, I prefer to call it talent-based branching instead of quitting, even though it's <laughs> essentially the same thing. And so I think you can come up with programs like that. But, that. but I think that we should really think about that role of the coach there who helps the person reflect also and, and you know, make sure that they're getting the maximum amount of learning from each one of those uh, zigzags. If you can set things like those up internally, I think... You know, you can cultivate a lot of 
a lot of internal talent. And this, this also gets to an issue the Abby Griffin's work that I talk about in range who studies serial innovators, it's people who make these repeated creative contributions to their organization. She like warns HR people saying, you know, when you define your job too narrowly, you accidentally screen these people out because they have these sort of eclectic backgrounds. They have a need to communicate with people outside of their domain. They, they, as she says, they appear to flit among ideas, which doesn't normally sound like a compliment. You know, they, they use analogies from other disciplines. And that's, you know, and, and I think it's, it's hard to tell someone to look for that, right? And so usually those people are cobbling together their careers by moving out of organizations. And then maybe by the time you have to get them, they're much more expensive. It would be much better if you could cultivate them internally. But I think you have to have the mindset that you have to allow some time of experimentation and zigzagging. So you have to sacrifice a little bit of short-term results. You know, I wish that weren't the case, but but I, but I think it is. And I think if you're willing to do that, you can develop internal systems like talent-based branching that will cultivate these kind of people. Some of your comments about like the quitting thing remind me of the, the comment you make about Winston Churchill's famous quote. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Because when I read that, I thought, are you kidding? Like, I had no idea. It's almost like the end of that uh, Jack of all trades quote. But can you just take a, a quick hit and run on that Winston Churchill quote about never, mm-hmm. never, never, never give up? Except yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Except, except, basically, the two convictions of honor or good sense. Right? Yeah. So, like, <laughs> never, never quit except when it makes sense. Yeah. And again, it's kind of co- telling that we drop that part of the quote, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and this reminds me. So, two days before my before Range came out, I, I subscribed to Angela Duckworth's newsletter. Two days before it came out, maybe it's a coincidence. I don't care if it wasn't or not. But the <laughs> title of her newsletter was "Summer is for Sampling." And basically what it said was, yes, you want kids to be gritty, but you don't want them to be gritty too soon because first they have to find the thing that they should be gritty at. And then she says, that took me a decade right. of like exploring stuff. And so on the one hand, I was sort of like smirked and said, okay, so does that mean that like be gritty when you should be is the advice, which I totally agree with. But on the other hand, I think it's great that she is nuancing these things and that sampling and, and being gritty when it counts don't have to be in zero sum competition. And she's pointing that out. So I like that idea, right? And I think it's very much in line with Churchill's actually quote, actual quote, which is like, have the capacity to never quit when it counts, but don't just like forge ahead stupidly because you started something if it doesn't make right. sense anymore. Right, right. I, I just love that. That was, that was a good one to add in there, my friend. So speaking of summer and sampling, a little advice for parents in our audience. You discussed this quite a bit in the book, but any little tips you could throw out to us in terms of kids' pursuits of sports, choosing majors, any of those types of things? Yeah, well, let me, so I, I, we talked a little bit before the recording started that I'm a new parent. And since, since I already mentioned talent-based branching, that made an impression on me where I think of my role as a parent sort of as the coach in talent-based branching, where my role is to facilitate a bunch of different opportunities for the kid and then help them reflect on those in a way that helps them get the maximum amount of learning about themselves as they go forward. So, so I think that's sort of a, a, a decent conceptual approach. When it comes to youth sports, who had had a tough one. So I, up until recently, I was living in Brooklyn, and there was a U7 travel soccer team that met at a park not far from me. And, and in my opinion, like if there's a single person in the world who thinks that six-year-olds can't find good enough competition in a city of nine million people, <laughs> they have to travel. Like then, I would like to meet that person. Uh, um, so I, I doubt it, right? Because I don't think like nobody stops to think, are we doing this because it's for the best right. development for the kids? No, it's because totally. those kids are are customers for whoever's right. running that league, and they want to keep the customers from the other sports. And you know, and if they can. Say like, well, you got to be on the U17 to be on the U18 and so forth, right? Mm-hmm. Then they have a customer for a long time. And so, so, I, so I don't like to tell parents like, hey, just have your kids play a ton of sports because I realize that for a lot of parents, the systems in place actually kind of make that impossible because a lot of these select teams and everything will put conditions sure. on people that, that doesn't allow people to do that. So, I mean, I think on the one hand, that's why Jean Cote's research, uh, it's Canadian researcher, sports scientist shows that the odds of becoming a professional athlete have been going up if you live in smaller towns because those places aren't so competitive with the select teams that the kids have to specialize with, mm. like pre-puberty. Interesting. Um, 
which is interesting. And his work's super interesting. So he, he computes odds ratios for uh, your likelihood of making it to the elite level based on the uh, size of the town you're born in. It's been going down, even for even way down. It's like you know, under towns of under 100,000 now, even for things like basketball that are traditionally associated with, with, you know, urban talent. Okay, so let's say that parents aren't really in a, you know, they can't just fuck the system because it's being forced on them. Then I think hopefully, and I, and I do think there are some people in very influential sport decision-making roles in America now that are sort of trying to change things, where if you're going to get the kids in, you can still encapsulate a lot of what diversity has to offer in a particular sport. Because I think I don't know this, but I think that multi-sport exposure is sort of a proxy for diversity of movement and diversity of mm-hmm. challenges that you face. And that it doesn't necessarily matter if you're putting on a you know basketball jersey versus a football jersey. So in France, for example, which won the last Men's World Cup, they started overhauling their development pipeline decades ago to come in line with some of this research where the kids are will get in the pipeline young. But they don't really, they don't then have them playing adult soccer. They have them doing this unstructured stuff. They're playing futsal, you know, it's like on different surfaces, uh, different size playing fields, different number of players. And so they're varying up the challenge a ton. Mm-hmm. It's like what you see if you go to Brazil. The kids aren't playing soccer, mm-hmm. they're playing futsal. Right. Yeah, and yeah. they're playing on sand one day and cobblestones the next day and on a volleyball court, you know, over the net the next day. And, and so it's really, they're incorporating a huge amount of diversity within the sport. And the same thing that Judy Murray, the mother of Andy and Jamie Murray does. She has a popular um, popular camp where because she's Judy Murray, people feel okay taking their kid out of the development systems and giving them to her. And then she has them kind of playing tennis, but okay, they're playing through tree branches one day or they're doing, you know, they're doing something with a racket and a ball, but it's not really tennis these diversity of challenges, but it's enough to sort of satisfy uh, parents or whoever that it's tennis related. And so I think within individual sports, we can be really creative and, and still get some of this value. But the problem is, you know, in France, they have this, for, for men's soccer, they have this sort of holistic pipeline, whereas we're not really like that, where if we have a system where, you know, the AAU coach's incentive is to win the eight-year-old national championships, which is actually a thing, um, <laughs> then, then the way to do that is to set, to like teach the kid plays and these so-called closed skills and how to press and all this kind of stuff. And so if that's all their incentive is to win with the eight-year-old, then, you know, it's hard to tell them to do what's, what's best for developing the, the future 20-year-old. Right. Right. Wow. Wow. All right. So what questions were left unanswered in your research? I mean, one of the real moving targets, <laughs> I hate to admit this, um, <laughs> was was like, what is a generalist, right? Mm. Um, and I think that's very much a semantic moving target. So we talked a little bit about patent research. So in, in the patent research, the patent researchers define generalists and specialists based on the number of different technology classes they've worked across, right? The comic book research can define it as the number of different genres someone has, has worked across. But in, in most domains, it's not that easy to quantify what it is. And then you see people like in the end of the book, I talk about Oliver Smithies, a Nobel laureate who I would say has two different, um, two different discoveries, essentially, or innovations that, that basically change the way modern science works. And when he was first trained to be a doctor, and then he went to a lecture on chemistry, and he says, whoa, this is really interesting. Like, I want to learn this. So he, he veers off the medical track and starts taking chemistry. And, and as he put it, Suddenly, he's not afraid of biology because he has a medical background, and now he's not afraid of chemistry either. And so he starts merging them. And you know, when I talked to him, he, he passed away not long ago. When I talked to him, he's 90 years old in his lab, by the way. He's a molecular biochemist. Uh, and then in his mid-50s, he actually took a sabbatical two floors away to learn how to work with DNA. And then, you know, so he, didn't, he learned that in his mid-50s, and that published his most important work when he was 60 and won the Nobel Prize as a geneticist. But... Mm-hmm. Before that, he'd been a molecular biochemist, which to any outsider sounds like the epitome of specialization, right? But at the time he was becoming that, it was a bold hybrid of different forms of this merging of chemistry and biology. So there you see someone who at a certain point, you would have called them, you know, this, this pioneering integrator. But then by the end of his career, you'd call him for sure a specialist. And so... So getting at the semantic distinction of what even is a generalist and a specialist was just very difficult 
uh, to do. And I think a real, a real moving target, you know, like I was talking about with someone about Krav Maga, the martial art the other day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Krav Maga is like, it's like an agglomeration of like a half a dozen other fighting forms plus some customization. So it's this total, you know, it in itself is a generalist creation, but then you know, people can specialize in that. So it's so I sort of find generalists and specialists to be this incredibly, you know, this, this real semantic moving target. So I tried to end the book with the last chapter of proactively picking people who are very special, you know, doctors and scientists, basically, and showing how within that some of them are still harnessing the benefits of, of broad thinking and, and what I call range. But I, but I still think the, the semantic distinction between generalists and specialists is actually a difficult difficult thing to define, except in some of the areas where it's quantified by the researchers themselves. But at least you've got the conversation moving now. Yeah, I mean, that. so I don't claim to have perfect answers. Pretty much anything I write about. <laughs> to, to actually anything I write about. But, but my feeling about it with this conversation of how broad or specialized to be is one that is either implicitly or explicitly important to most people or maybe everyone at some point in their life. And it pretty much happens only based on intuition. And when I think of something like that, you know, that's how I felt about the sports team too. When I think of something like that, a conversation that's ubiquitous, but almost always based on intuition, my goal is to bring together some material that makes those conversations hopefully more interesting and hopefully more productive and not only based on intuition. So that, that, that's kind of, kind of my goal. Hmm. Very well done. So let's turn the mirror around a little bit. How have you applied the discoveries you've made in your research to your own life? Yeah, I mean, one of the most concrete, so a few concrete things. So I mentioned already, I'm taking the, I'm the coach in the talent-based branch yeah, to, to my absolutely. kid approach. Your child. Um, and, and I, and I got to say, I was more oriented toward like cult of the head start before. So I actually, you know, it actually feels a little better too. I feel like a little less pressure about it. So maybe <laughs> it's kind of nice, but so w with the work of Herminia Ibarra, who studies how people make successful career transitions and, and unsuccessful career transitions, um, left an impression on me. She had this, this phrase I love that we learn who we are in practice, not in theory. And what she means by that is there's like, you know, there's lots of personality quizzes and things that kind of implicitly want to convince you that you're a static product, right? This is who you are. What, what's your, what's your match? And what she argues is that our insight into ourselves is actually constrained by our roster of previous experiences. And we actually have to do stuff to figure out who we are and then reflect on it. And that's why we change as we age. You know, that's why, Sometimes we realize that like marrying our high school sweetheart, once we learn a lot more about ourselves in the world, it wasn't actually such a good idea. Not saying it's not a good idea for everyone, but, but probably for most people. Not. Um, so she says, act and then think, right? And so I was thinking about this. And because I'm constantly, by the time this book, you, you know, by the time Range came out, I'm already back in the beginner mindset for whatever's <laughs> next. I don't even know. So it's kind of right. funny, right? So as soon as people are saying, oh, great job. Like, you're really good at this. I'm already like, Totally back to like feeling like a freshman in life. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I started this thing I called a book of small experiments where I used to keep a, like a goal journal that was akin to what I had when I was a runner and you know, where as a runner, you have these very specific time goals, oh, sure. competition goals. And I actually found that that didn't work as well for me, in my, my sort of work world because the goals are not as black and white and they're moving a lot more and things like that. And I was learning about myself a lot more. And so so I sort of dropped that for a while. And now I'm back with this, this book of small experiments where basically I treat it sort of how I did my, you know, notebook when I was a grad student. Where it's like, here's something I want to explore about myself or some skill I want to learn or some interest I want to pursue a little more and, and see where it goes. And here's, how, here's my hypothesis about, you know, what I can try to, to learn that or explore that. And then I go do it and come back and that book of small experiments forces me to really reflect on the experience and, and see what I got out of it. And I, I'm doing that constantly now. And he, I did it. I, I interviewed her many early in the, the range process. And so after that, I started doing this like right after that. And it led me to when I got stuck with the, the major challenge for me in book writing is structuring this huge amount of information, like defining the playing space, first of all, because you can go in a million different directions. Sure. And then structuring the information, and I got—I just got stuck at a certain point. I was just my my brain was overheating, is how I how I say it to my wife. Um, and 
So I decided to take an online fiction writing course just to mix it up. Beginner's fiction writing course, right? Nothing I've done matters in writing. Nobody cares. And it was kind of a revelation for me. So um, one of the exercises, you had to write a story using no dialogue. And after doing that, I realized I had been leaning on quotes in, because I had been, between books, I had been writing shorter shorter pieces and shorter mm-hmm. pieces tend to be more quote heavy if they're more sort of newbie. And I had been leaning on quotes to do explanation that is much more clearly done with with narrative writing instead of quotes and saving the quotes for sort of the voice of the characters or, or points of emphasis. And I, it was kind of scary to me because I didn't even realize I was doing that until I sort of got knocked out of my my what what the economist Russ Roberts told me he thinks of as the hammock of competence because it's so comfortable you don't stand up to look around at how mm-hmm. you can do something better. I went back through the through the manuscript um, at that point and stripped a huge number of quotes and replaced them with what I think is more clear writing. In some cases, that required me to go try to understand a little bit better too what what I was saying, so that I couldn't put it just in someone else's sure. words in their mouth. But that that really attuned me to the fact that competence is great, but it can also be a little bit of a a little bit of a trap where you cease looking outside to, to hone your skills. And it really attuned me to that. So I think I'm going to do, and, and so after that, I started taking more of these, right? <laughs> this sounds stupid, but it was like a Japanese, <laughs> Japanese comic book convention at a hotel, like three blocks away from me. And I noticed this because suddenly, you know, half the people in the neighborhood were wearing costumes. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, that or I was like, oh, you know, so suddenly so many wizards in the neighborhood. Um <laughs> And so I, so I walk over there and buy a ticket because they have like a beginning like Japanese comic book writing class. And I'm like, I, I agree. One of the people I've most enjoyed meeting who became a role model for me in the book is a woman named Frances Hesselbein, the former CEO of the Girl Scouts. And she told, she kept saying, you have to carry a big basket to bring something home. And what she meant was if you have a really open mind, you can learn from any experience. And so I started realizing I can learn a ton from like beginning writing classes. So I go take this, you know, so I sit in on this class and beginning Japanese comic book writing. I'm not going to write a Japanese comic book, but it's, it's about structure and it's about, um, you know, dialogue and narration and development and all those sorts of things. And so like, you can, I, I've now convinced that there's no amount of beginners writing classes I could take and not learn something from. Wow. And so, so it just sort of oriented me toward this continual experimentation and not just, not just continuing to do things I already sort of feel confident in. And, and I think I was maybe already a little more oriented that way than the next person because when the sports team came out, suddenly, you know, I'm identified as this sports guy. And sure. most people don't know, two, two weeks after that came out, I left Sports Illustrated and went to ProPublica and started reporting about totally different stuff. And I, I don't recommend that. I, if I'd known that the book would kind of take on a life of its own, I would not have been changing jobs right when sure. it came out because you know, suddenly you have to prove yourself to like new editor doesn't care at all about sports stuff or that other thing. But I think I was, was kind of oriented toward that anyway, but maybe I had started to take it for granted because I think I had stopped trying to think about ways to, you know, enhance and diversify my skills that were, were not in my direct line of sight. So now I'm like really leaning on this book of small experiments and making sure that I'm, I'm doing something at, at regular intervals. It's not just what's in my direct line of sight. That's a, such a great example. Someone that's respected so much as a writer saying, hey, I went to this beginning fiction writing class and it, it made a difference. Great example. So two more. If you had an opportunity to create a billboard that would be seen on the busiest road in the country, what would it say? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> billboard. Take your time. I think, I think it would say, don't feel behind. Don't compare yourself to people who aren't you, who are younger than you, compare yourself to yourself yesterday. Love it. Love it. Better than yesterday. Love it. All I right, guess I'd have question. to use medium-sized fonts on the billboard to get all that in. No surprise. <laughs> it's all right. We'll, we'll make it a really big billboard so we can Great. stay with <laughs> your, your big one. So last one, just kind of a summary. Any final words of wisdom? Now, the, the general audience is folks that are in the health and wellness world, especially coaches. They're trying to positively influence their clients, the people around them, that kind of thing. Just any Anything I haven't asked that you'd like to get out there that, that might help those folks have that impact that they're wanting to have? Well, you know, first of all, I think people in general, and obviously everyone is an individual, in the health and wellness area tend to look at things in a more holistic way mm-hmm. than um, 
people in most other industries. So I think in some ways, those who do well in this industry are kind of the master generalists in certain ways, Mm -hmm. because they are they are thinking about not only the whole organism, but often the whole organism in, in a context. Right. And so, so I think this industry, you know, when people are doing well, does a pretty good job. And one thing I think that could actually help them, you know, with their value proposition, essentially, is the fact that and I write about this a little bit in, in the last chapter, but, but even more so in a ProPublica story called when evidence says no and doctors say yes. So that's, it's obviously available online, where specialization in medicine has been, you know, both inevitable and beneficial in many ways. But it has also meant that specialists are now all pretty much using what's called surrogate markers. So they're not looking at the whole organism. They are, you know, a cardiologist, maybe not even looking at the whole heart. They may be just working with cardiac valves. And they change, so they see some issue with a cardiac valve, and they, they change it, and, you know, problem fixed. But what they actually care about is, is the person less likely to die of a heart attack or stroke? And what we're seeing now is that in many cases, these surrogate markers are not actually a good proxy for the whole organism. So people have their cardiac valve altered or their blood pressure numbers altered, and then they die of heart attack or stroke at the same rate with lower blood pressure numbers. And so I think this more holistic approach, um, there's a huge value proposition that that I think becomes much more enticing if the field can not denigrate medical specialization, but express some of the limitations of working from surrogate markers and help people understand how much, in many cases, more important, but certainly critical it is to have people who are working zoomed out, looking at the outcomes of the whole organism in their specific individual uh, context. Excellent. Excellent. Great advice. David, I, I really appreciate it. I've looked forward to this one since we set it up a couple months ago. I know you're crazy busy. Congratulations on the book. Outstanding. And uh, all the best. We'll look forward to the next next uh, round of experiments coming to the forefront. Yeah, I no, appreciate it. And I appreciate you being uh, patient with me while I was a hassle with scheduling. I, I didn't expect the book stuff to get quite as uh, out of the gate quite this quick, I guess. Well, it's exciting. Well done. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It was worth the wait, wasn't it? You should see my notes. Scribbled thoughts all across the page of things to look into, reminders of key insights up in the corner, and even a reminder myself about what he said about the hammock of competence becoming a little too comfortable. Thanks again to David Epstein. Again, the title of his latest book is Range. You can also follow him on Twitter, at David Epstein, E-P-S-T-E-I-N. And as hard as it is to be authentic on a format like Twitter, He actually achieves it, as you'll see if you're on there. Also, if you do enjoy Twitter and you like insights on this kind of thing, human performance, you can follow me at Catalyst, the number two, Thrive, at Catalyst to Thrive. Remember those dates of the upcoming coach certification in Colorado, August 10th and 11th, and New Jersey, August 16th and 17th. The Rocky Mountain Coaching Retreat and Symposium is September 6th through the 8th. And then our last certification of the year is November 9th and 10th in Colorado as well. Make it a great rest of the week. Keep chasing better. And after hearing from David, we know better might also mean taking a little different route towards that better than maybe we've considered in the past. Thanks as always for joining us. And I'll look forward to speaking with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst Health and Wellness Coaching Podcast.